<laughs> it's for stinking Lincoln for sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was, it was crazy. Like, I had never thought, like, he was this wonderful person, but I never knew what a piece of shit he was until I started watching your content. Well, he's the worst. I mean, he's... Yeah, all the stuff we have today with the... Just the corporatism that's just... They think it's inevitable, whatever. It wasn't like that until him. Yeah. The marriage of well, corporation and state, the lobbies, all the interest groups going to D.C., you know, that's a Lincoln thing. Well, and he, he was the one that to insti institute the uh, income tax, right? Oh, yeah, he created the income tax. He also started a war that killed over a million people. Genocided Indians, like, uh, yep. Uh, But hey, he tried to end slavery in the rebelling territories only as a tactic when he was losing on the battlefield everywhere. Didn't free his own slaves, right, in any of the northern territories. <laughs> what a joke. Three days before he was shot, he was planning on what to do with the blacks, like where to send them, because they were not going to live together. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I, I knew he kind of introduced uh, or ended slavery because like a bunch of like untrained people uh, uneducated people being introduced into your society like that that's just going to screw up your entire uh, economy right there we can see what the plans were and that it just ended up well, most people end up being sharecroppers and the the over a million blacks died after the civil war between then and 1900 uh, from just starving. A lot of Southerners were starving during Reconstruction, but a lot of them, they, okay, you're free. Free to do what? Couldn't get a job anywhere. Um, no longer had free food in the house out on their own. A lot of them just died. And you can see his plan. The only Northern Territory that freed slaves during the war, other than, I guess, West Virginia at the very end, was Washington, D.C., and he offered, first of all, he compensated the owners $300, which is an enormous amount of money at the time. And he offered the freed slave $100 if they'd leave the United States. Oh. So it's like, you're out on your own with nothing, good luck, or take this 100 bucks and get on a boat. Right? His idea of abolition wasn't because of sympathy for blacks. It was... He didn't want slave territories expanding west, which he totally planned on killing all the Indians and taking the land, because he didn't want blacks and whites to live together at all. And he stated as such, like, well, you know, if slavery doesn't expand, then blacks and whites will not be, we cannot mix where they're already not together. He wanted separation. He thought it was better for both races. What? Just what a piece of shit. Can't just live I'm with people. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm just amazed that he gets the praise that he does, and just gets like sprinkled in just like powdered sugar with everybody. It's well, he's all the warmonger presidents. What is this, and who is this? Oh, is Nick joining this too, or am I on two shows? Did I uh, double book? <laughs> did you double book? I think I might have. <laughs> Um, okay, he might have been the one that wanted to talk about Libya and Syria and all that then. Um, shit, what to do? Let me talk to him real quick. Are you pressed for like it has to be right now or could we do it in like an hour? We could probably do it in an hour. All right. Thank you. I'm going to grab this other dude and then I'll be with you. See you soon. Okay, no worries. Okay, talk. All right. Uh, what happened? Hello? Hey man, we're, uh, it's, we're early. I don't know if you wanted to start now or... In an ah, hour. that's what it is. I was on another show. And uh, I double booked. I was just talking to the guy. I thought he was you. <laughs> So if you have an hour, I can go back to ripping on Lincoln, and then I can come on with you and, and talk about uh, Libya and Syria and so on. Sounds good. Uh, do what you got to do. Hop in around like 9.45, 10. I set the show for 10.15. This way we can shoot the shit for like 10, 15 minutes before we get started. Okay. That'll be 11 here. 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> then I'll see, see you in soon. a little bit. Okay. Cheers, man. All right. Uh, <laughs> I hope I can get back to number one. Hey, he was an hour early. That's what it was. So I said, I don't know if you can hear me. That guy was an hour early. I thought so. Okay. We can rip on Lincoln. I was like, I was ripping on Lincoln, and I'm not doing this right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to switch gears and, and talk about Libya later, but that's fine. So. It's really it's amazing because... Um, Barack Obama, the first, at least partially black president, made slavery great again in North Africa by blowing up Gaddafi and his kids and toppling Libya along with NATO. And just they destroyed that country. That was a functional North African country that they blew to pieces and they put Al Qaeda in charge. Well, and now you can buy slaves, right? Like you could from like 2011 to about 2017 or so. You could buy a person for four hundred bucks. Wow. Yeah. Way cheap now think about this. That would have been about forty thousand dollars in the Civil War period. Four hundred bucks. Into in, in two thousand eleven money to buy a person. That'd have been about four dollars or something <laughs> in the eighteen sixties. Maybe forty. Yeah. Hold on just one sec and then we'll uh, we'll hit this live. All right, so I pretty much just jump into it. I don't really bother with the intros anymore. Doesn't matter. People My name's on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Hi, I'm Ryan. I've been banned on everything. I do geopolitics. Exactly. Yeah, I've made some movies and books. Check out the website if you want. <laughs> <laughs> on to the content. Pretty much. Let's see. So I do have a By the way, I don't know if this comes in clear. You got to get the rest of this title. It says, As Organized Crime. <laughs> <It's a scene. laughs> oh, man, I love it. It's basically what it is. I think Pompeo's escorting Pelosi right now. Yeah, anyone, that, let me, just to say real quick about China. Last election, there's two parties, like a pro-Japan and a pro-China party in Taiwan. And the pro-Japanese party just barely won last time. And so one or two elections from now, the, the old KTM party is going to win and they're going to be Chinese anyway. So there's no reason to go to war and lose all that equipment and manpower when you're just about to take it peacefully, right? So, who'd want to pop off a military conflict? The U.S. or China? <laughs> right. So they send in Pelosi and Pompeo, you know, and it's pissing off the Chinese. But I hope they don't take the bait. It's tempting. They're like, we could sink a U.S. carrier. You probably yeah. could. You probably could. They could sink a bunch of yours, too with their subs and stuff it'd just be a disaster for everybody and right now economically neither side can handle that yeah yeah for sure certain country in the Middle East would be laughing his ass off though anyway <laughs> well cool I'll uh, Lincoln. drop you down bring you back up after the, uh, the okay intro. cool
Welcome back to Rise to Liberty, and I've got probably the most important person that you've probably never heard of, <laughs> and that's Ryan Dawson of ANC Report. Thanks so much, Ryan, for being on the show today. I like the heavy metal, and I like Rise to Liberty. My old boinker was Rise to Cents. Oh, nice. My name being Ryan, I spelled it that way. So, it was from Thomas uh, Paine's Common Sense, and it was also like Sense as in Sensei, which is, you know, yeah. I'm living in Japan. Yep. So, real quick, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, you're probably the most banned person who's not on the internet. Uh, Nick, Nicholas Fuentes, eat your heart out. <laughs> like Nick, come on. I was being banned on AOL and MySpace when he was in middle school, possibly elementary school. <laughs> We've been kicked off all the same things. I just got kicked off him first and multiple times. Yeah, exactly. He is so, censored, though, and I disagree with that. Even though, like, yeah. it doesn't matter what I think about what he says. He shouldn't be censored. He's not saying anything illegal, and he shouldn't be censored. Yeah, completely agree. Uh, same with you, though. Um, oh, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, have yet, I have yet to see anything that you have said that is illegal, uh, controversial, sure. Um, but illegal or anything that not saying anything hateful FBI either. That's what I get accused of. I'm like what? Yeah. What? I don't want you shooting Cal Palestinian kids in the nuts. I guess that's anti-Semitic. Oh, I'm not supporting ISIS. I guess that's Islamophobic. You know, that's the kind of canard we have today. Yeah, that's just ridiculous. Only so women should play women's sports. Uh oh, you hate trans people. There's no nuance anymore. You deny their existence. <laughs> I do, actually. <laughs> like, I mean, they exist, but like they're playing pretend, and I'm not going to go along with it. Yeah, but that's hate speech. Yeah. So, that, that's just insane. I mean, I think you hate women. You're invading their space. Yeah. You have all these biological advantages, and you, it doesn't matter if you reduce your hormones. That's only one of the advantages. Like if you're a swimmer, for example, you have a larger lung capacity, you're taller, denser bones, all that. Like, it's not just the muscles and things. It's not just testosterone. Like, you're so different and should not be playing sports against one another on a professional level. It's common sense. It's why it's segregated. Well, and who thought that uh, saying something like you should not inject children with uh, hormones would be such a controversial statement. Yeah, don't give little kids puberty blockers. Kids don't have agency. Yeah. <laughs> Leave them alone. That's crazy to me. I don't care. Yeah, like, they, they confuse masculine and feminine with male and female. It doesn't matter if a boy wants to wear pink dresses or whatever. He's still a boy. He's a boy that likes dresses. So what? It doesn't make him a girl. You're actually reinforcing the stereotypes of gender roles and be saying, oh, well, girls are supposed to wear dresses. So if a boy wants to wear a dress, he's supposed to be a girl. No. He's just a kid, and he likes to wear a dress. So what? Is he like a boys are boys, girls are girls? That's permanent. Feminine and masculine are the social constructs. Those are the ones that are, like, arbitrary as far as what, what all colors mean and stuff like that. That's societal, and it differs from one place to another. Pink used to be the boy's color, in fact, and baby blue was the girl's color. There's nothing in nature that, like, sets set up, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, one thing we were talking about before uh, the stream started was what a piece of shit Lincoln is. Yeah, I agree with that. That's so, almost an insult to shit. <laughs> so, do you want to give a quick rundown of why Lincoln is such a piece of shit. Yeah, stinking Lincoln is often praised like Jesus Gandhi or something, and, and he's the great abolitionist and freed the slaves. And so, if you go after him and someone's of that ilk, it's like, what are you, pro slavery? Blah, blah, blah. Well, I, absolutely not. I mean, slavery is horrible, and we shouldn't have instituted it in 2011 when Obama invaded Libya. And we shouldn't have offshore sweatshops today. Right, and all the exploitation uh, that occurs in labor today. Apple, you know, making phones in China with women jumping off buildings that have suicide nets. That is sick and disgusting. That's not what Lincoln did. That is your school book fairy tale version of what the man was and what he believed. He was a staunch racist, which is not uncommon in the 1850s and 60s. That's 
pretty much what almost all of them believed, including uh, blacks, Indians, and Chinese themselves. There was a superior and an inferior, and Lincoln was a man of his times. He was not above the times, and he wanted racial segregation. And he was opposed to slavery, but not because of how immoral slavery is of you know owning a person like property and the way they're treated. It was simply because he didn't think blacks and whites could live together at all. And he didn't want to expand slavery out west because he didn't want races to mix. But the South had already conceded to not expand slavery out west. It didn't matter. And he actually, the, the Congress before the Civil War, um, uh, the Congress, I forget the names, but it was out of Ohio and one out of New York, but they, well, one was Corwin, but the Corwin Amendment, this constitutional amendment that enshrined slavery into the U.S. Constitution. The federal government could not interfere with states' uh, laws about labor. And the South rejected it and seceded anyway because that was never the reason for the Civil War. But they act like it, it's a better reason. Like It sounds better to fight a war to, friend, to free the slaves. So that's what, <clears throat> from around the 1960s to now, has been the rationalization for <clears throat> a war that murdered a million people and displaced uh, if you were to take it by percentages and given all the starvation and death from the war and reconstruction uh, just within the first year after the war ended from like 1865 to 66 it would be like America getting in a war and losing 17 million people that's how devastating the Civil War was even like forget per capita just on raw numbers more men died in the Civil War than all of America's other wars combined. But we are the racist country. Right. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's pretty hard to fight a war over slavery when seven of your own states have slaves, and that's black slaves, and all of them had coolies, Chinese slaves, and, and Native American slaves. Or just uh, even worse, just genocided them like General Custer did, who was a Union general. He was in the cavalry at Gettysburg, right? And then he's fighting a little bighorn and greasy grass and wounded knee. That's all. It's the same people, same Union soldiers, same Union generals murdering Indians. They they weren't like anti-racist or anything like that. And the last states in the Union to end slavery were all northern states. The entire South was done, right? Your June 16th or whatever, your June 10th, June 19th. Um, California still had slaves. New Jersey still had slaves. Kentucky, Delaware, like the, all these northern states had slaves. And California did end it on paper, but not in reality. They continued to enslave blacks, natives, and Chinese uh, for decades after the Civil War. And so did the Nevada territories and so did what ends up becoming Utah for a long time. Okay, and... General Grant had slaves throughout the duration of the war. So did Washington, D.C., West Virginia, Maryland, you know, Missouri, all, like all these border states, plus Jersey and Cali. So you can't really be fighting to end slavery when, you know, half your side still has slaves. And they weren't. And there was no, they were like, there were people who believed that, people who didn't. But the South was fighting because they got invaded. People didn't join the Army of Northern Virginia, you know, People who didn't own slaves and never would did not go and fight and die so some rich person on a plantation in Mississippi could have his slaves. They went there because Yankees invaded Virginia and were shooting, burning, raping, looting. So they went to stop them to protect their own homestead. You know, it's, it's when you explain this to liberals, you have to give them an example of when a Republican did something wrong. So let's say like, the second invasion of Iraq, purely based on lies. No, it wasn't for oil. It was all about Israel, but whatever. Why do you think the Iraqis resisted U.S. occupation? Was it because they all loved Saddam and everything he stood for and did? Or because we were over there killing them and blowing up their homes, bridges, and infrastructure, and they had suffered through all the Clinton sanctions, watching their children starve to death? Okay, maybe... That's why they hated us. So Maybe the Confederacy the fought you because you went into their land and set it on fire and started shooting people. Maybe. But that, that doesn't like, nah, man, you're fighting because of this and this political reason. Like, no. 
They're fighting because you have an invading army and navy on their land and in their territory yeah. waters. Which, which makes complete sense, and it makes sense that uh, Lincoln actually was not doing any of the things that uh, modern history books say. No, he started the war, too. The war didn't start at Fort Sumter. The war started when he sent revenue cutters like SS Harriet Lane down and shot at the Nashville and tried to blockade Charleston Harbor and collect his new export tax and shooting people, peaceful uh, protesters in Maryland and arresting people and arresting judges and thousands of people thrown in jail, 300 newspapers shut down. I mean, he was the old, he was the old school woke neocon, right? Just shut down the paper. You have to understand there is no TV or radio or internet. So if you close down the newspapers, that is the media. And that was the, the marriage of the press and the state it starts with Lincoln. He shut down any paper that was critical of him. And so it's just state-run media. It's kind of like New York Times and Washington Post today. They're war propagandists. They go along with whoever's in charge, right? The Post might as well have just been CIA for decades. Every single war, think about it, in your lifetime, in your parents' lifetime, in your grandparents' lifetime, every war started with a lie, right? Oh, Saad gassed his own people. No, he didn't. Oh, there's weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. No, there isn't. All oh, babies on incubators. Nope. Gulf of Tonkin? No. Like, <laughs> Go through the list. It's a lie. And every single lie, every single one was supported by mass media because there's no dissent. And that includes social media nowadays. Look at the Ukraine conflict, right? Everything on Twitter and Facebook is pro-Ukraine because if it's not, you get kicked off the platform. And every talking head Working. promotes the lie. That all started with stinking Lincoln. We used to have hundreds of different papers. Now we've got like six main ones. And they all fall in line. Lincoln did that. Lincoln married the corporation estate. The railroad companies, the steel foundries, they're all getting giant subsidies from the federal government. And, I mean, it's easier to control when you only have six main papers. Yeah, and it's... Look, nowadays, it's the there's four major industries that profiteer through government. You've got the MIC, right? The military-industrial complex. That's how you get monstrosities like the $1.5 trillion F-35 and stuff like that. <laughs> You've got Big Pharma, right? Which... Even before COVID-19, it was something, right? It's, it's the Oxycontin, the Ritalin, the whatever. They're always pushing out antidepressants or something, something on children on whatever. Um, then you've got uh, big energy and you got ESGs, all this green energy. I, that kind of dovetails with the, with the rest of it. But energy now, the big new thing is the wind turbines and solar panels and stuff. They're destroying the economy by trying to transition away from fossil fuels. And it doesn't work. I mean, the output of solar panels and stuff just aren't there yet. And so they don't care. It's a government subsidized industry. They invest in it. And the price of these things is going up not because of the earnings or uh, from the output of sales or production. It's just based on new investment. And people are investing because the government's investing. So it's a short shit deal. It's creating a bubble. And, you know, the national interest be damned. But that whole philosophy of the government picking winners and losers in the marketplace is a complete antithesis of the Jeffersonian, like, John Locke model of how things ought to be. Thomas Paine, James Madison, Monroe. That's that you could call it the Jefferson faction. Lincoln was a Hamiltonian. Alexander Hamilton, Henry Clay, Lincoln, they believe in a strong federal government and they they don't want free markets. It's free markets on the bottom, but at the top it's all it's all the state. And so and then he instituted the income tax. It was not Jekyll Island, it was not that's the Fed in thir in 1913, that's bullshit. It was Lincoln. He started it. And his greenbacks and uh, this this one triggers me like didn't he go against the fed because of the greenbacks 
there was no Fed to go against, first of all. <laughs> he did have greenbacks. They were worth about 35 cents at the end of the war. You know how he paid for the war? War bonds, which the South had to pay, and they had to pay in gold. He had driven the nation into That's hyperinflation. Mm hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. Grant, part of that, too. Of course, General Grant becomes president because all the southern states other than Tennessee had a military occupation and veterans weren't allowed to vote. And blacks voted as a block, however the Union told them to. That's why they were given the right to vote. Interestingly, they weren't giving the right to vote in the North, just the South. There was black suffrage, but only in the South where Republicans could use them as a voting block. Just like illegal aliens today, they don't give a damn about their quality of life or anything. They just want them to vote Democrat. Um, states like Wisconsin, or well, actually the whole Northwest just made rules saying, no, we're not, blacks can't vote. And then the only few northern states that allowed it were the ones who had no significant black population and it didn't matter. Like Maine is half of a half of a percent, who cares? But places like New York, they said, yeah, you can vote if you own property, which none of them did, right? So it took a long time to get black suffrage in the north. But it was instantaneous in the south and they also took voting rights away from whites. Um, so it's like... Well, how is that equality? In that you, you granted one group, and only the men, not women, one group rights, but you took them away from another. So it shows you it wasn't about like helping blacks. It was punishing the South. Like if you're going to give, it's not about equality either. If you're going to give rights to blacks and take it away from whites, it's just political. You want them to vote a certain way. You're afraid the other group won't vote that way. So you take their right to vote away and you give it to the other one. And then you tell them, yeah, we gave you that, so you should vote for us. It was about political power. And all the new senators out west, they had like 12 new states, and uh, every single one of them got two Republican senators. So what, what would the exact reason be that Lincoln and the North would want to hurt the South so badly? Transfer wealth to the North. It was his bankers. Lincoln, in the beginning, was hesitant. It was his, it's the little snakes in his ear from Boston and Philadelphia and to a smaller degree, New York City. New York City also threatened to secede and join the Confederacy. That was 1861, January 6th. <laughs> Isn't that something? <laughs> but no, the bankers got in his ear because they weren't going to allow Charleston to have a free trade area. I mean, if they have it, we need to have it. Why? What's going to happen, you know? Half the country, there's no tariff or a very small one, and whereas yours is 45%, right? The writing was on the wall. You have to force them into the union. You have to collect the tax. And what was happening, too, is they're collecting taxes from the entire nation, but they're spending all the tax revenue in the north. So, again, it was taxation without representation. You're going to tax the hell out of the south and southern products. Cotton, the south is producing 80% of the cotton in the world. Okay, tobacco and other things. It was cash crops more than agriculture, but things made and sold in the South to Europeans, and the entirety of it almost was spent on northern public works and northern industry. And the government should not be in the business of selecting who all gets to do well. Like, we're just going to give money to such and such railroad that you know half of Congress is tied to in one way or another, right? It's profiteering. And they were in competition with building railroads out west. They wanted to connect with California desperately. And Chicago and New Orleans were in competition. Well, New Orleans has slaves. And the north has, uh, well, they also basically had to script pay slaves too. And they had the federal government giving them money. Right? So they're going to end up with it but you get these giant robber barons you can hear the kids screaming it's distracting the hell out of me i'm sorry <laughs> i can't think he's it's, it's cool i, I can he's it's about his nap time so but anyway yeah it was government subsidies and they and like why they wanted to punish the south too i mean they lost a lot of people the north yeah. the north wins the war but they lose 150,000 more guys i mean they in every battle they were losing almost every single battle they lost more men than the south did um, 
Gettysburg, it was like the only time where it was like, I don't know, like 23,000 to 25,000 or something where the South lost more men. But sometimes the law, they like Cold Harbor, the North lost 12 times as many people, right? Fredericksburg, they lost seven times as many people, the first Fredericksburg. They were getting destroyed on the battlefield and they shouldn't have because they have way more artillery and the better kind. They have naval ships that <laughs> South had to turn merchant ships into into warships. They have way more soldiers. You know, hundred thousand man army in some cases. You know, they better equipment, better guns, better horses, better everything, and still lose. Because their command was by and large chosen through nepotism. And they also had a lot of uh mercenaries from like Ireland and Germany and you know couple guys drop beside you and you're like what am I doing here and turn around and run and the south had some pretty fantastic generals in Stonewall, Forrest and Lee uh, and Hoke later in the war and, and the north is mm, mediocre to terrible and the south had a few bad ones like Bragg but um, they just had better command structure more experience They've um, some of them fought in the Mexican war fought in the Indian Wars and the North benefited from all that but didn't have skin in the game right but when they started fighting each other southerners were to everyone's surprise destroying these giant northern armies that war could have been over in a year if they had done what Wilfred Scott said just set up a blockade and wait because they were, there was no without um, the ability for trade the South was not self-sufficient it was it didn't have a manufacturing base barely um, I mean almost the entirety of their cannings were out of Birmingham like they just didn't have they did a couple bullet factories in Richmond like there wasn't they didn't have those things so they weren't planning on going to war they seceded they didn't secede and then attack the north they seceded and then the north attacked them they weren't trying to take over and force their way on the north is the opposite they left because of the uh, Lincolnite taxes on them, among other cultural differences. And a lot of the southern states were already phasing out slavery. Right? It was southern presidents that ended the transatlantic slave trade. Jefferson did that. He also ended the expansion into the Ohio Valley region and uh, tried to end slavery in the state of Virginia, lost by just a couple votes. Virginia did end slavery during the Civil War, so did Tennessee. And Virginia was the largest southern state. Didn't matter. It's never what the war was about. Everybody knew that. So history is just not what we're told. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, that's part of the basis of my entire show, is breaking your government instilled programming. I'll, tell you, I'll add something else, too. It wasn't even North versus South, clearly. They talked about the Mason-Dixon line and all that. State of Maryland did not secede, had troops on both sides. North Carolina and Tennessee had troops on both sides. The, the third largest regiments in the Northern Army uh, by the end of the war were from North Carolina. Right, They had more troops from North Carolina than most northern states other than Pennsylvania and I think Massachusetts. So, you know, it was like if the other half of North Carolina, if Western Carolina and East Tennessee had fought for the South, you might have had a different war. And then obviously the Western part of Virginia, which had slaves, becomes West Virginia, right? It doesn't secede. They stayed in the Union. The rest of Virginia didn't. Um, but the entirety of the state had slaves. And Virginia ended it before West Virginia did. <laughs> See, I heard only by a week, but still, you know, it's because... The Western territories, Western Virginia, East Tennessee, West North Carolina, were not that affected by the tariffs because they're not on the water and they're not doing sea trade. So they didn't care and they wanted to stay in the Union. But everybody along the Mississippi and everybody along the coastline wanted out because they were getting raped. Right. But you can see like, well, why do these territories, why are they still fighting in on the Union side? Because they they were not being squeezed and they wanted to stay in the United States they were not feeling the tariff pressure the way the East was 
But believe me, they definitely had slavery. <laughs> that didn't matter. So I, I do kind of want to switch gears here just a little bit and uh, talk about 9-11 because that's one of the things that you're known for. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's, that's actually how I uh, had found your content was uh, researching 9-11 myself. Also, I was told I shouldn't listen to you, so you were the first person I listened to. And so I guess my first question would be, what, what is the, the biggest misunderstanding about 9-11 mm. that most people either get wrong or something wrong that they believe? I would say not even wrong, like don't know at all, and that would be the anthrax attack. There was a follow-up biological attack that's with notes full of weapons-grade anthrax that said 9-11 on the top of the notes, death to America, death to Israel. And they were sent to U.S. senators and people in the media to try to kill them, Patrick Leahy and Tom Daschle. Patrick Leahy had the Leahy Amendment, which would forbid military aid to Israel. So they tried to kill him. And... In the beginning, everybody thought Al-Qaeda had sent the anthrax because it said 9-11 on the top of the notes. Uh, we just had a terrorist attack from Al-Qaeda. Somebody sending weapons-grade anthrax to these people, um, U.S. senators and such. And it had also been mailed from the locations of where the hijacker cells were, right? So it's concentrated in Florida and New Jersey. That's where the letters come from. They thought, oh, okay sleeper cells, whatever. They sent anthrax after the other guys ran the planes in the buildings. Very quickly, though, from analyzing the anthrax spores, they realized, nah, nobody from cave did this. This is, had additives to it. It had a uh, catalyst placed on it. This came from a very advanced lab. There's only three countries in the world with the capacity to make this. The United States, Russia, and Israel. So somebody either infiltrated a lab and stole it or they're still working there and so they chased around this guy named Stephen Hatfield for a while and then this guy Bruce Ivins who was suicided before he had a trial but what people forget is this attack was used as a justification to invade Iraq Colin Powell went to the UN with a mock vial of anthrax right he holds up a little vial with white stuff in it. it wasn't anthrax but it's to look like it and made this whole presentation straight from George Tennant and Louis Leibowitz by the way about mobile weapons labs uh, that had the ability to make anthrax and this dovetailed off another lie that came from James Woolsey and then later the New York Observer which owned by Kushner where <laughs> Based on Israeli intelligence, they claim there was a meeting in Prague, Czech and Israeli intelligence, they said, a meeting in Prague where Mohammed Atta, the guy that ran Flight 11 into the North Tower, met with senior Iraqi officials and they passed the anthrax. And this was written about on the Weekly Standard, it's an outfit for PNAC, Project for New American Century. And they are claiming there's this meeting in Prague and between Iraqis and 9-11 hijackers. After the first anthrax letter was open, they waited. Then they're like, oh yeah, uh, and, and? The Iraqis gave Al-Qaeda anthrax too. And we know because the Israelis witnessed it. Well, the Israelis did not witness that because that never happened. There was no meeting in Prague. Iraq didn't have anthrax, neither did Al-Qaeda. So the Israelis made it up. But that was used as the pretext in Vader Rock anyway. Hey, their violation of UN Resolution 1441 stipulating they can't have WMDs. Anthrax is a WMD. They passed it to Al-Qaeda who attacked us with it. The whole thing was a lie. And they knew it was a lie. That's why they dropped, they, they stopped saying it was Al-Qaeda. The official story blames it on Bruce Ivins, the guy that worked, worked at Fort Detrick, Maryland. Interestingly, is they ignore the fact that a man named Philip Zach, Philip Zachariah, had been caught on camera stealing anthrax from Fort Detrick, Maryland in the past, right before 
the World Trade Center attack in 1993. He'd been fired from his job. He made a gang called the Camel Club. And they were picking on this Egyptian co-worker, harassing the hell out of this guy. His name was Assad, too. During the anthrax investigation, somebody sends an anonymous letter to the FBI blaming Assad for the anthrax. And he knew it's who it was. Oh, that's that guy that got fired for harassing me and is on tape stealing anthrax. He was illegally doing gain-of-function research on anthrax in the lab. He had a cohort, uh, Dr. Ripley, that uh, Miriam, she, um, she let him in at night after hours after he'd been fired. And there's 23 samples of anthrax missing. Okay. Most likely, that someone involved with that stole it again and that's who mailed it and blamed it on whoever they could blame it on Hatfield, Assad, Ivan there, you know, Al Qaeda, anybody, but the ones that are like, who, who would write death to America, death to Israel on the notes. And then also say they witnessed a rock giving the anthrax to Al Qaeda. Who? Iran? No. Cuba? No. It's North Korea? No. Somebody. I, just, I can't. It's right on my nose. Hmm. Who did that? <laughs> The same people, I mean, you look at PNAC, is full of a bunch of Zionist Jewish supremacists that are lying about everything. They lied about, and you know, William Sapphire, Guardian of Zion Award, writes about, oh, there's chemical weapons in the palaces of Saddam, right? Nope, you lied. New York Times, full of shit. And then, of course, Judith Miller. She blamed everything on Iraq. She blamed Oklahoma City on Iraq. She blamed 93 World Trade Center on Iraq. And obviously, she's going to blame 9-11 on Iraq. She's dating Lewis Libby, who's a lawyer for Mark Rich, who's a Mossad agent, um, Cheney's chief of staff. Got, you know, Mark Rich was pardoned by Clinton his last hour in office. James Woolsey, the guy that lied about the anthrax, was the head of the CIA chosen by Clinton, blackmailed by Epstein. There's almost like some group has infiltrated the United States and is just filling us with bullshit about our media and lying about Iraq and mailing anthrax to senators who are critical of Israel. Gee, I wonder who it is. Then you see the Israelis <laughs> celebrating the attacks of 9-11 at Doric Towers, doing a little jig, high-fiving and hugging each other. All of them lie about their timelines. You got another group of Israelis straight out of Jerusalem that were arrested are doing illegal work on the fire prevention systems in the World Trade Centers. That's another one that's missing. So I'll tell you what happens when people talk about 9-11. They talk about Mo Building 7 and <laughs> physics. That's all they talk about. And the role... 9-11 was a jointly conducted covert intelligence operation similar to Iran-Contra. You got multiple players. Saudi Arabia, Israel, the United States. Like most operations go, I mean, the Contra affair deeply involved the Israelis and the U.S. Deeply. The Israelis have been doing, diverting guns out of Nicaragua for generations. The Somoza family have been diverting guns on their behalf since the 40s. And so, yeah, they're involved. The U.S. gets involved after the coup in Rand 79. They try to warm up the faction that still exists there giving them airplane parts and stuff and making money off the contraband sales to pay for the Contras to kill Santanistas in Nicaragua because the Santanistas are the ones who overflew the Somozas. Well, it wasn't enough, so they end up getting into the narcotic business too, and you know all that with the Barry Seal and so on. Barry Seal, trained by David Ferry, by the way, from <laughs> JFK. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um... Yeah, CIA brings in drugs. No shock, right? And the proceeds yeah. go to for off-the-books, black-budget things, including supporting Contras, warlords, terrorist groups, you name it, across the board. Anything they can't publicly find. Right, and that's what the opium in Afghanistan was for. It wasn't just to create an opioid crisis in the United States. It's the profits. So that's how we pay al-Qaeda. That's how we paid HGS on Ursa Front, or Al Sham, and all the moderate rebels in Syria. That was narco money that the CIA laundered through groups like Purple Shovel and all these intermediaries and stuff. But ultimately, there, it's just a bunch of conduits, including the FSA itself, to get money to terrorists to uh, try to topple the regime in Syria. 
And what is, what use is the to topple Assad in Syria? Is that in American interest or Israeli interest? It goes against American interest, but it's in Israel's interest, so we do it. Because they have a massive blackmail and bribery circuit inside the United States, deeply rooted in there. And that's why these people can bulldoze down a house and just run over people and set them on fire and move into someone's living room and say, if I didn't do it, someone else would. And our press won't touch that with a six million foot pole. And how does Epstein tie in to a lot of that? Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell and Jean-Luc Brunel were running a blackmail ring. Epstein's problem was he dipped in his own supply. It was on behalf of the Israeli state. That's why all the seed money is coming from Les Wexner and Leon Black and Glenn Dubin. And they all have something in common. They're supremacists and they're working for the, and this, I mean, the Maxwell family itself. Her father work for Israeli intelligence uh, explain the bell real quick the merchant bell yeah it's just saying because if you're on YouTube whatever I don't want to get you banned by saying a certain word so yeah. but they all belong to a little tribe that wears little hats and this needs to be pointed out I'm gonna be real fucking clear this isn't like the Jews that's retarded it's those Jews not the Jews yeah. and you should be able to point out supremacists no matter who they are. White supremacists, Jewish supremacists, black supremacists, Muslim supremacists, whatever. But you can't. Because people are so hypersensitive on to go on a witch hunt to find a racist or a sexist, a homophobe, or something, something, you know, that they hear the word Jewish and their fucking brain turns off. Right? But <laughs> look, yeah. these people are fucking child murdering pedophiles. And they happen to be Jewish. Gee, Jewish supremacists are Jewish. I wonder why. Yeah, most Nazis are white too. Because <laughs> why wouldn't they be? But millions of Jews have nothing to do with this. Don't own a bank. Don't own media. Aren't pedophiles. You know, it's just this. You're talking about a couple dozen people. Okay. But they're the ones that are in charge. Because they, the U.S. has a interest in letting extreme groups come into power and that it doesn't matter if it's a jewish extremist muslim extremist cartels in mexico whatever they support the drug cartels they support wahhabi salafists and they support zionists because all, when any of those kind of groups are in power it's a guaranteed recipe for conflict and conflict means you get to sell more guns it's all about the money and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, oh yes, Bahrain, Israel, all these companies with these, all these, that's I call them companies instead of countries. <laughs> all these companies <laughs> have despots for leaders because the U.S. backs the Likud party. They back the Saudi monarchs, right? And you could click it over to Asia. It's same story, Africa, same story. Do it or I'll kill you and put your cousin in power, that kind of stuff. So Boko Haram, all these groups, none of these groups would exist if the U.S. was genuinely against them. But they're not. They want them fighting each other. It keeps them down. Keep the Middle East in an arms race. It's good for U.S. hegemony. You know, and the U.S. and Israel have this relationship. The only colonial power that didn't die after World War II were the Israelis. They're annexing land on Palestine. It's a colonial regime, just like the British, the French, the Americans. They're taking territory. They're ethically cleansing people. They're setting up Jewish-only settlements. You, by like a rule you have to be a Jew to live in them no other kind of person can live in them it's a racist pariah state and these racists have a lot of compadres in the US, Canada, whatever that are like because of the trauma of the holocaust and other things feel like they can do no wrong and they have to support them or it's going to happen again or something and in a way, they kind of do have the tiger by the tail because Israel has preemptively attacked all their neighbors. They've attacked the United States, too. And at even 10% of this, if the public was aware of all the things that Israel's done, including stealing nuclear weapons from the United States, killing sailors, blowing up hotels, you know, chopping off heads, torturing kids, all the stuff they do, that state wouldn't exist. 
And so it's they're in an existential crisis. It's like, well, they can't undo all the stuff they've already done. And so they're in a parasitic relationship where they have to maintain control over U.S. media and, and military power or it's over, right? They're, they've already crossed the line like into the land of unforgivableness, right? They bombed Syria. They're still doing it. They've attacked Lebanon. They've attacked Egypt. Jordan, like everyone hates them um, because it's a racist pariah state, but they're able to exist based on might makes right. They have force alone. That's it. And so all their eggs are in one basket. It's the United States. And the moment that relationship ends, Israel's done. Well, and they, they do a lot of weapons research for us, right? Like they, they, do they do it for themselves. We, well, <laughs> With our money. Yeah. yeah. And then we, we buy them, manufacture them, and then sell them to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. We give them away to Israel. We sell them to the Saudis. Uh, the Saudis buys a lot of that stuff with the, the dollar overhang, you could say. But these perfume princes, the reason they have the relationship they have with the United States is cheap oil. And even in the, the U.S., like when we're talking about like electrical production, only 1% of U.S. electrical power is from oil. The other 99% are 51 is from coal. And the rest is from like hydro, nuclear, and so on. Only 1% is oil. Oil is just for gasoline. But keeping the oil production rate high undermined the Soviet Union, undermines the Russians, because they're dependent on selling oil. So if you make it cheap, it destroys them. The higher the gas price is, the stronger Russia is. As Al, you can see the stupidity of the current regime. <laughs> We're going to sanction Venezuela and Iran and Russia and have Saudis already at maximum capacity, and we're not going to buy from the Russians at all, but you are, because you're just going to buy it from somebody who buys it from them, so they're still making the money. So you're making them stronger than ever. But they don't get it. Like, the way Reagan got to them was, make the oil cheaper. Because the Russian economy at that time was very dependent on natural gas and oil. If you make it cheap, they can't earn enough, and things fall apart. And that was why they brought the Saudis in. So you had the war in Yom Kippur in 1973. OPEC caused gas lines inside the United States. They were like, shit, we're vulnerable here. We got the media, we got the military, we got the largest economy, but we're very dependent on these imports. So what they do? Join us. Let's create this safari group, go in in 76. The Bush family especially gets very tight with the princes and says, you're going to produce this much and we're going to give you the latest weapons, we're going to send Bechtel and Kellogg Brown and Root and Halliburton in there. We're going to build your sewage systems, your roads, whatever. You're going to become a modern country. They take that deal. We modernize Saudi Arabia. They keep the oil flowing. Keep that price down. Not only for the U.S., but mostly to hurt the Soviets. So that, and that click from the Safari Club, they're already joining an Israeli-U.S. nexus that existed prior to that. So there's the triangle. Saudi Arabia, the U.S., and Israel. Uh, and the French. And then, um, it's long story. I've outlined this in a five-hour movie called The Empire Mast. Like, why we are so tight with these cliques. And I did an interview with Dan Sanchez from uh, Freedom Foundation that went over our Saudi U.S. history. It's about an hour and something length, but it's a good one. Somewhere on my website, because it's banned, you know, all my YouTube's banned, all my Vimeo is banned. All, you know, I'll talk about these things. And woke culture. I was getting banned before the woke culture, though. I was getting banned in 2005. It's, um... Long before woke culture. Yeah, way before. It's just, that starts, what, 2013, somewhere around there, with the Soros crew. You're not allowed to say things that threaten the system. You can criticize President so-and-so, they don't care. If you criticize Israeli Prime Ministers, you're gone, because that's who's actually in charge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. the old saying of, uh, want to know who is actually in charge, uh, look at who you can't criticize, right? Yeah, Kevin Alfred Strom said that. If you want to know who rules you, just see who you're not allowed to criticize. Often, often misattributed to Voltaire. Although I could, you know, imagine Voltaire probably says... He said so many little witty, quirky things. Yeah, maybe he said the same. <laughs> so, 
So one, one thing I want to touch on before we uh, wrap up is exactly what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, there, there's a lot of propaganda around that, and there's not a whole lot of sources I would trust. Uh, you are a source of, that I would trust with what's happening. Thank you. I, I would say Doug McGregor, Scott Ritter, Larry Johnson, uh, Andre Makinov, um, Judge Napolitano, or at least he'll get the people on who can speak on it. Pep Escobar. Uh, there isn't much. <laughs> Joaquin Flores. Like there's myself. There isn't much there. Uh, essentially what happened was that might on coup in 2014, uh, they, you know, these little neo-Nazis and stuff walled people up and burned them in buildings and uh, physically assaulted people, color revolution style. They're attacking eastern Ukraine where a lot of ethnic Russians live, Russian language is banned. But the worst thing is ongoing fight, basically a war, civil war in 2015. And Ukraine murdered 13 to 14,000 people, mostly civilians. And then they were gearing up to do it again. And they had to mince the cords, which Zelensky broke. Portoshenko had done the same thing. They're, they're all terrible. It was a selected government. Victoria Newland's on tape saying, FDU, let's put Yatsnik in charge. US is the most blatantly installed U.S. coup we've ever done. Didn't even try to hide it. And then NATO's a threat. You saw what they did to Yugoslavia. You saw what they did to Libya. You see how they behave. Nobody wants that on their doorstep. Ukraine's built up this massive 600,000 person army. Why? Right? They already murdered 13,000 or 14,000 people. And then they bring in February 17th, heavy artillery. So that's the state. That isn't just somebody with a sniper rifle that started to pop off. They brought in heavy artillery and fired it in the Donbass. Five days after all of that, Donbass starts firing back. Then Russia comes in, kicks them out of the Donbass region. That's happened. That's Donetsk and Luhansk, um, except for Kharkiv, I suppose. But Serbo-Donetsk, Donetsk, Lizyshanks, all these territories. And there's a land bridge to Crimea as well. Um, Crimea, by the way, seceded. It was not annexed. There wasn't a shot fired. Everyone acted like Russia invaded Crimea. Russia already had a base in Crimea. Crimea used to be part of Russia all the way until 1954 anyway. Um, Khrushchev gave it to Ukraine because of the, the horrors of Holodomor and Soviet occupation. He was from there. But it's Russian and people who live there speak Russian. It's Russian culturally, ethnically. You know, They're Eastern Orthodox Christian. They're Russian by any way. You can say it's Ukraine, whatever. And it rejoined Russia because Ukraine was 15 billion euros in debt regional scapegoating, neglecting the area, abuse of all kinds. So they left. Rejoined Russia. The media acted like Russia took it by force. Nope, they had a referendum. 98% plus decided to get out of Ukraine and join Russia. They have a better life. Ukraine's the most corrupt country in Europe. Other than maybe like Nigeria and Malaysia, probably the most corrupt country in the world. Um, it's run by oligarchs. The Ihor Kolomoisky, they're involved in human trafficking, drug trade, mafia stuff, the worst things you can think of. These are not sympathetic characters. Zelensky, well, he's coke addict, pedophile, all that. But they act as a giant money laundering operation for people like Conrad Black and Hunter Biden and all these, you know, DNC assholes. Hunter Biden worked for Kolomoisky's Burisma Holdings, right? And a no-show job. Okay. It's the same stuff he's doing in China with Bohai Harvest and Rosemont Seneca and so on. And a lot of the girls, John Luke Burnell's last modeling outfit, by the way, was out of Kiev. He was the number three guy in the Epstein ring. Maybe the number two guy, really. He got arrested and suicided in jail, just like Epstein. But he's one of these French perverts that had MC2 models are just straight out of Tel Aviv and then Karen in Paris and then later New York, Miami and so on. Uh, that is directly tied to Ukrainian oligarch uh, front companies, rule, transit, fake passports, all those, all supported by the state of Ukraine. Major industries selling people. 
And that's a long story, too, to sum it up in a few minutes. Ukraine fired on Donbass after many eight years of abuse. Russia finally was sick of it, didn't want NATO on their doorstep, and went in and kicked them out. And the rhetoric is all Ukrainians always on the verge of winning. They're losing hundreds of men a day. It's sad. Uh, they need to negotiate before they lose Odessa, too. Russia's going to gobble up. They could go all the way to the Dnieper River. They're going to stop whenever they feel like it. They could take the whole territory, but I don't think they will because they don't want to deal with an insurgency for the next 40 years. But they're going to take all the majority uh, ethnic Russian territories, and that's Russian forever. Good job, Ukraine. You just lost billions, hundreds of billions of dollars worth of infrastructure and, and millions in population. For what? For what? Right? Because NATO encouraged you to kill Russians? Well, bravo. You just cut your country in half. Good job. Sucks for them. I wish, I hate I mean, war. I wish they'd end it. I wish they would just realize they have no hope of winning this war. NATO weapons and money or not. They need to have concessions. Cede the land you're going to lose anyway in order to get you know, to get peace. Or keep fighting, lose 50,000 more people and still lose your land and a bunch of money and make the situation worse. Zelensky is not going to negotiate. He doesn't care how many Ukrainians die. He's making personally making bank off this. So he's going to keep doing it. I'm predicting the Ukrainians are going to kill him themselves. His own military or police are going to get rid of him. You watch. Spicy take right there. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, from what I understand, I wouldn't be surprised at this point. Uh, They'd have I would to. see no reason for them not to. After Severodonetsk and Lizzie Schantz, like they are like, we need to retreat. We need to fall back, like strategically. Well, from a PR point of view, that's bad because he completes his takeover of the Donbass. Guess what? He took it anyway, and he lost thousands of more people for nothing. Zelensky doesn't care. He's over there doing Vogue magazine poses. You know, he's a dead man walking because the Ukrainians are going to get rid of him. Which is just the craziest thing I think I've ever seen was him on the cover of Vogue. Like, when he's grabbing his wife, they don't even look like a couple. He's just like, come here, I got this one. No, she looks scared. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's cheating on her. He's cheating on her with men, too. Uh, this is well known. Like, she's just a, oh, I ought to have a wife. Like, you know what I mean? It's not even. <sighs> yeah. He, look, he looks like a little gremlin. He's always got his stupid uh, tailor-made green t-shirt with the, sl the sleeves um, shrunk so it looks like it hugs his biceps more. He's a little five-foot-nothing comedian troll. And that's what Kolomoisky and these guys, they put up a front of like actors and stuff. The whole cabinet is like that because it was a convenient way of paying thugs and putting them on the payroll would be like, oh yeah, this guy's the art director, assistant, something, something of this television production. How much did that joke cost? I don't know. It's, you can't really like put a number on it. So it was a nice way of putting a bunch of thugs on the payroll and then claiming, oh no, that's, I'm not, that's not campaign finance or anything. I'm paying them to be, you know, part of this television studio. Uh-huh. Right. And so, I'll, it's, it's to steal a phrase. If a clown walks through the palace, it doesn't make him a king. But it does turn the whole palace into a circus. And that's what you nice. have in Ukraine. A fucking circus full of clowns. Well said. So, the thing I want to wrap up on is... Uh, well, I Israel that from Franklin, but that's alright. <laughs> <laughs> that's alright. Um... I wanted to uh, kind of wrap up on your new documentary, uh, New Mac. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. I did include it in the episode description, so make sure and go and watch it. Um, Impossible for me to do without Roger Monson and Grant F. Smith and all these people that did all this work. This isn't like a lot of other films. That's all me. But this one, um, so many people did so much of the work already. But it's... I felt like this needs to be in film version. I add a lot of things with JFK and um, and Epstein and so on. It's not just about the nuclear theft, but that one's um 
I'm proud of that. I mean, that could be in theaters. It's so good. It won't though I because agree. of the subject matter. But <laughs> yeah. if you want to know how they stole Let's the bomb that. and killed the president, uh, I didn't even mean that. My hand. Is, <laughs> if you want to know how they stole the bomb and killed the president, go watch New Mac. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic documentary. Um, I was blown away. Uh, everyone that took part in that did an amazing job, and uh, he pretty much provided it for free on Rumble. So yep. there's literally no reason to not go watch this. It's only like an hour and 20, something like that. Thousands yeah. of sources. And it, it ought to create a lot of questions because there's a lot of things we sort of half went into but didn't want to make a 10-hour movie. So I'm there for the Q&A whenever. And I I'm, I'm appreciate coming on your show. Maybe we'll talk just about New Mech sometime. Unfortunately, I got another show like right now. The two because I double booked. <laughs> Well, no problem. Honestly, Ryan, it was a great pleasure. Um, you are more than welcome to come on any platform that I have at any point in time to talk about any of this super important stuff because I truly do believe that a lot of this really is important and people do need to hear these things. Well, thank you. I hope I don't get you banned. I knew the risk coming into this. So, you know, <laughs> if it happens, it happens. We, uh, we will rebuild. Um, so do you want to let everyone know where they can find you? We'll build back better. ANCReport.com, as written next to my name, is my website. And that has Odyssey, Rumble, Gab, VK, Telegram, the uh, all the alternative stuff. So I'm not allowed on anything else. Can't use Patreon, can't use PayPal, can't use Facebook, can't have Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, da 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 da, da. It's all trash. And I feel like... I don't know. It, right now it sucks. We're in a building phase, but as more people get banned from saying their opinion about COVID or election fraud or whatever, you know, anyone's getting banned for anything right now, that we're having a viable alternative now because there's so many people who have nowhere to speak. So get on your Telegram, get on Odyssey, get on Rumble, BitChute, Gab, places like that. That's the new stuff. And I've been on all of them since, like, day one. <laughs> yeah, and it's honestly some of the best places to uh, check him out or check out Rise to Liberty. We are also available on all these platforms. So make sure and check us out oh, there. Oh, excellent. Oh, yes. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll put your link on Substack and hopefully get cool. you some followers. Cool. Right on, man. Thank you so much. That would be great. Not a problem. But, uh, Thanks again for doing this, and thanks to Reed Coverdell for uh, everything he does and hooking us up together. Oh, and yeah, that was Reed, wasn't it? That's right. Yeah, props to him. Had him on a couple yep. days ago. Um, guy's doing good work. Oh, yeah. Make sure you go follow the uh, Naturalist Capitalist, and uh, we'll get you back on soon, Ryan. And uh, go have fun on the next show, and uh, I'll be talking to you soon. All right. I'm, I'm going to change gears, and I think I'm talking about Libya now. So see okay. you. <laughs> Alright. Uh, is it this one? Guys, I'm. Y'all watch on an Odyssey or whatever. I'm gonna end this and start a new one. So, I'll be right back. <laughs>